All right, back from break. Uh, let's take a look at those homework uh, sample problems uh, from chapters 43 and 44. So uh, I'm going to start with chapter 43. I think it's just a couple problems from the chapter. It's talking about muon decay, and it asks kind of an interesting question. It says, when a muon decays, what's the most kinetic energy an electron coming out from the decay could have? Now let's talk about the decay a little bit too. Uh, th this is a this is a good uh, sort of uh, example reaction for us because what it's doing is it's keeping track of all these lepton numbers. So what we saw with um, leptons with 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 uh, particles that are electron like particles, electron neutrinos, mu's and neutrinos, tau's and neutrinos is that uh, the muon is going to decay into uh, its neutrino. So it's going to turn into a muon neutrino. Then we have a W right there. Hmm, the W didn't... Anyway, there's a weak interaction. That's a W. And uh, that W con uh, connects with uh, another particle-antiparticle pair. In this case, it's the electron and uh, the antineutrino of the electron. And so uh, these are the particles that we'll see coming out of the reaction. The neutrinos are very difficult to measure. Uh, the electron is pretty easy. So when we run these reactions, the electron is the one that's going to get picked up uh, in our detectors primarily. And what we observe is that there's a range of possible energies of the electron. And that's what it, uh, suggested to physicists that this is not a two-particle uh, decay. If something decays into just two particles, those two particles have to have equal and opposite momentum. That's the only way momentum can be conserved. And if there's a fixed amount of momentum, that completely determines the amount of kinetic energy each particle will get. So what we've seen, an example of this is alpha decay. In alpha decay, those uh, the alpha particles coming out for a given uh, decay reaction are always the same. And so uh, in the muon problem, now in here there's three particles coming out. With three particles coming out, there's many ways that the uh, kinetic energy can be shared. So let's, let's start this problem, I guess, and what we'll do is we will go back to our formulas that we've come up with. Uh, we're we're, we're going to use one of these kinetic energy formulas. We're going to make a bit of a modification here. So, uh, first of all, we're going to say the starting mass is the muon, and then uh, the mass we're interested in, M1, is the electron. But what we're going to do is we're going to take both neutrinos and treat them as if they're just one particle. And here's how that works. If we say, here's the muon just sitting there at rest, how could we give the electron as much kinetic energy as possible? And the way to give uh, the electron as much kinetic energy as possible is to give it as much momentum as possible, and that is to take everything else happening in that reaction, bundle it together as if it's just one particle, and send it together off in some direction. So that's what we did. We took both neutrinos, treated those two neutrinos as if it's one particle, and then sent the neutrinos in one direction, the electron will head off in exactly the opposite direction, and by getting as, as everything else combined into one, uh, that's, the, that's the largest amount of uh, momentum we can give the electron. So uh, we're not going to do any detailed mathematics on this, we're just going to use this, uh, this approach. Uh, and so I can take M2 and use these two masses. Now we've been treating the neutrinos as if they're all massless, which is a good approximation because uh, they're, you know, they're like an EV or something. Um, and so what that says is the Q value then is 105.2. So we can plug that into our standard kinetic energy formula here. And I'm only going to solve this for the electron. And uh, it, I guess I should have solved it for the neutrinos, huh? Oh, we, we kind of have, I guess, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, we have right here, of course. Here it is. So when I do this formula, what we always have gotten here before is that part tells me what fraction 
of the kinetic energy is going with one particular particle. And uh, we're looking specifically at the electron. And what this calculation tells us is almost half, we can get almost half of the kinetic energy to go with the electron, but we're always going to have half the kinetic energy go with the neutrinos, at the most. Now, uh, that's only one configuration of how this decay could happen. I mean, we could have these head out in three different directions. We've really only used everything along one dimension. Uh, we could have another example. We could have any individual particle just be at rest after the decay has happened. One of the particles could be left there at rest, and then the other two particles shoot out in uh, opposite directions. So, uh, carrying on this calculation told us that the most kinetic energy the electron will ever have is 52.35 MeV. I thought what we might add in is well, what's the least amount of kinetic energy the electron could get. And since there are three particles coming out, it's possible that when the muon decays, we leave the electron just sitting there at rest, no kinetic energy at all, and uh, that uh, momentum effect, that remaining kin the, the kinetic energy effect, the kinetic energy, instead of going into the electron, gets uh, divided up between the two neutrinos. So it could be uh, that the electron gets uh, no kinetic energy at all. So you can see that's a wide range of possible kinetic energies for the electron coming out of muon decay. All right. Okay, questions on that? We're, we're, I know we've gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of mileage out of uh, these kinetic energy formulas. We've used those in, um, in the nuclear physics chapters. We're now using them in particle physics. So uh, they have come up a number of times, and they're, um, they're pretty handy. Okay, here's one more. I think it's just these two examples from chapter 43. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually two different reactions, or I'm going to claim it is. What they do in the problem is they ask us uh, about this reaction. They say, what happens if we have a neutrino come in, uh, react with a neutron, uh, and we produce a muon and a pro? So this is, uh, I'm going to call it neutrino scattering off of a, a neutron. Uh, but what I wanted to compare it with is neutron decay. So we looked at neutron decay in class, and I'm going to say that's an important uh, rea um, reaction also. It's one that you should know pretty well. Uh, so the neutron uh, actually becomes a proton by having one of the quark flavors change. So if we take one of the D quarks, or one of the quarks in the neutron, and change its flavor from D to up, from down to up, um, that's going to give, uh, that's going to boost the charge by plus one, and it creates the charge of the proton, and uh, it's going to become a proton. And so that is going to be, uh, this combination of quarks doesn't have quite the same mass, very similar mass, but it's a little lower in mass than this combination of quarks, and it's what we, you know, know very familiarly as the proton. Now, what had to happen in order for, um, in order, to, in order for one of the quarks to have its flavor change like this? We're going to need uh, a W. So we're going to have the W carry away the negative charge uh, from that reaction point. Remember, the D coming in had a charge of negative one third and the up coming out has a charge of positive two-thirds. So that's a change of one, and that means we had to pull away a full unit uh, of negative charge in order to, uh, in order to have that uh, take place. All right. So here is the... Um, here is the uh, W minus coming out, and then it couples with an electron and an anti-electron, an anti-neutrino of the electron sort. So that's what the Feynman diagram looks like. Now I drew it a little differently here. I drew it here with a bend to kind of uh, emphasize that the proton uh, is not going to be lined up with the direction that the neutron came in. Neutron comes in, proton heads off in some direction. Uh, the electron and neutrino also. 
and this is what we saw with, with neutron decay. Now, in this example, too, I, I wrote in W minus W plus because I, I think we mentioned this in class, um, that when we carry out this calculation, when we set up the mathematics and we carry out the calculation, we actually allow for the possibility that this, this reaction vertex occurred before that reaction vertex, and that would have, in the direction of time, the W traveling in the opposite direction. In general, when we look at these Feynman diagrams and we carry out um, calculations using relativistic uh, particle physics formulas, um, the time ordering can be reversed uh, for the virtual particles. So we have to allow the possibility that the virtual particles either started here and went to this location, or that the particles started here and went back the other way. Maybe a better way of thinking about it is, when I look at the wave function, there's going to be a wave function representing the uh, W in this reaction. There is a wave function that overlaps everything going on, and the presence of that wave function, we're really calculating the probability that a W comes into play and is able to transfer energy and momentum and charge back and forth. Anyway, that's uh, the Feynman diagram for neutron decay. Now, uh, the reaction we were looking at, or the reaction we're interested in, is this, uh, in 4345, is this uh, neutrino scattering reaction. I just wanted to point out it's, it's got a lot of similarities. So it's a neutron, again, uh, turning into a proton. Uh, these are gluons. So uh, here, uh, these are the gluons. I'm hoping you guys remember all that. Uh, these are gluons holding all the quarks together. So the quarks tend to be held together very firmly. Uh, we just don't see individual quarks. We only see composites of quarks, things like neutrons and protons and such. Um, now in this, instead of the W connecting with uh, a particle antiparticle pair that's coming out, there's actually a reaction. There's a neutrino that comes in. So the neutrino comes in and then converts into the muon. So kind of in the same sense that the down quark uh, became uh, switched over. The quark that was in the down state switched over and went into the up state. This is saying that the lepton that came in in the neutrino state switched quantum states and became a muon. Uh, the neutrino now is in the muon state. And, and that's allowed because um, W's do connect to uh, leptons. They're flavor changing. Uh, W's connect to quarks. They're flavor changing with the quarks. And they always shift the charges by one. And, and that's what we're seeing at both of the reaction vertexes. Now, I just wrote this as a W because, again, when we carry out the calculations for these, we're allowing for both possibilities. That it could have been that uh, this reaction occurred first and then went to here, or that the uh, reaction here occurred first and the W is going the opposite direction. If we switch the direction of the W, the time direction, the sign will change. It will go from minus to plus and, and, and back and forth. And so it's the same Feynman diagram, except uh, we took the uh, neutrino, the antineutrino, which was effectively going backwards in time, flipped it around so instead of being an antineutrino, it's now a neutrino coming into the reaction. Uh, and instead of an electron and an electron neutrino, it's a muon and a muon neutrino, but anything an electron can do. Hey, the muon can do the same thing, right? It's got the same set of properties. It's just got a lot more mass to it. So uh, that's just kind of a comparison, uh, you know, kind of a discussion of some of the things we've seen with these uh, Feynman diagrams. All right, I think that's it for chapter 43. Let's move on to our very last chapter of the book, um, astrophysics. So, uh, homework problem 4415, I pulled that one out. That always raises some, some good questions. And uh, for this, uh, it's kind of a star classification problem. It says that we are gathering information on a couple of stars, and the stars uh, 
are found to be in what we think of as being the same cluster. So you'll, you'll see groups of stars that occupy a certain you know, direction in space. Maybe there's hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of stars in these clusters. And uh, if they have kind of uh, you know, a, a, a range of luminosities or a range of brightnesses that correspond to what we would expect from a, 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 you know, several thousand stars that are all formed kind of from the same dust clouds or whatever, then we, we imagine them to be kind of localized in space. And that would mean they're all at the same distance. So if it, if it really is a star cluster, if it's a true star cluster, that group of stars will have formed at about the same time. Okay? And that's really useful because it allows us to sample a bunch of stars that all developed uh, kind of came into existence from you know some hydrogen clouds, um, kind of around the same time, and see what the star uh, distribution looks like. So we can assume the distance is the same. Now the information we have on these two stars, and we're going to call them star one and star two, uh, is that when we look at the light, uh, star one uh, peaks in uh, kind of a really really almost in the blue part of the spectrum. And uh, star 2 peaks actually in the infrared. So star 2 is going to look red to us. We don't see the infrared, but we'll see some uh, red from the visible spectrum. Now we can use, um, where is that? Here it is, Wien's Law. So uh, the, the peak wavelength times the surface temperature is equal to a constant, which I, I like to call A, 2.9 million nanometers times Kelvin. So this is the peak wavelength, and this is the surface temperature. And I, you know, I, I can't tell you how important it is to not say that's the temperature of the star. It's the surface temperature that we're looking at. That's where the light that we observe has been generated, is in the outer regions. The spectrum of light will, will um, give us information about the surface temperature, not the core temperature of the star. All right, so these are the surface temperatures that we can calculate using Wien's Law. We can see that, you know, again, this is going to be kind of a reddish star. It's peaking in the infrared. Uh, this is going to be maybe a blue star or something, 6170. Now, for the distance column, I just said they're both at the same distance. D1 equals D2. I just wrote that as D. Uh, as far as brightness, oh, I should have written that down. So this is brightness. <coughs> this is luminosity. Now remember, brightness is the same thing as intensity. Here we go. Brightness is the same thing as intensity, and the brightness as we're looking at is the intensity measured on Earth as the light comes in. So we're not measuring the intensity at the surface of the star, we're measuring the intensity of light observed in our telescopes. And then luminosity is the same thing as power, so that's going to be some number of watts. All right. Um, so I just wrote down the brightnesses, I wrote down the luminosities, and I wrote down the radiuses uh, just to get the symbols defined. And then I wrote down some formulas. Now, the brightness we observe here on Earth is going to de be determined by the luminosity of the star, you know, how much energy is it putting out, uh, divided by uh, the distance, uh, specifically a spherical spread. So as the light spreads out spherically in all directions, uh, that power gets divided over bigger and bigger surface areas. And so the brightness we observe is going to depend on how far away that star is. Now we can flip that around and say, well, the luminosity then can be determined by taking the brightness we're observing and multiplying by 4 pi d squared. Unfortunately, we've got to find a way to come up with d. So uh, what we'll do is, for, at least for now, we'll sidestep d. So we'll set d to the side and say, uh, if I use ratios, and we're going to use ratios a lot here. So uh, I'm going to take the luminosity of star 2 divided by the luminosity of star 1 and say that's the same thing as the brightness we're observing divided by, you know, the brightness we're observing for star one. Uh, the distance will factor out. And so whatever the ratio of brightness is we observe, that is the ratio of luminosities. We don't know exactly what the luminosity is, but we're going to know what the ratio of luminosities is 
for those two stars. And what they tell us is that the ratio of luminosities is 11.0. Now they actually wrote this as like the inverse, like uh, 1 over 0 0.09 or something. Uh, I flipped it over and, and turned it into 11.0. Um, <clears throat> so that's giving us a ratio of luminosities. Now we can use ratios some more. We can also say that the luminosity produced by this star uh, can be uh, uh, the total energy output we can uh, calculate by looking at the temperature at the surface and the total surface area. So, um, so what's really determining the luminosity of a star is the rate at which the fission is taking place in the core. That luminosity of the star is going to show up uh, the luminosity, a higher luminosity, is in general going to create higher surface temperatures and uh, depending on what stage the star is in its development, it'll have a, a smaller or a larger radius to it. So we can relate all of these. It's important to realize it's not a causal relationship. It's not that the temperature is causing the luminosity. Uh, if anything, it's the luminosity that's, that's, that's determining what the temperature will be at the surface. Okay, so we can use another ratio. We can say the ratio of luminosities, which we know now is 11, uh, can be set equal to this formula written once for star 2 and once for star 1. Uh, the sigmas will cancel out. We know the temperatures because we knew the peak wavelengths. So we do have information on the temperatures of each star. The four pi's will cancel out. And so what we're left with is uh, the ratio of temperatures to the fourth power and the ratios of radiuses squared. Now in the problem, they're asking us to find out what this ratio is. And specifically, they don't say radiuses, they say diameters. But if we find a ratio of the radiuses, that's equal to the ratio of the diameters. It'll be the same ratio. Uh, and so what we can do now is we know the ratio of the temperatures, we know the ratios of the luminosities, we can calculate the ratios of R. Okay, so I, I guess I rewrote the formula here, and then I flipped it around there. And then I solved for R2 over R1 squared. I put in all the numbers. There's the ratio of the luminosities. This turned out to be a factor of 60.6, but I hadn't taken a square root yet, so I had to take a square root. Uh, and get R2 over R1. Now the diameter ratio is going to be the same as the radius ratios. The twos will cancel. And so it turned out to be um, 7.78. So star 2 uh, has a lower surface temperature, but it's bigger. And that is starting to sound kind of like maybe one of the red giants. So I pulled out an HR diagram. And uh, just to remind us, there's the uh, main sequence. And uh, most stars, uh, stars spend most of their lifetime as main sequence stars, stars that are fusing hydrogen into helium. And so most stars we look at are in that stage. Uh, the giant stages don't last as long. Uh, but what it sounds like is one of these stars is, is likely main sequence. It has kind of a higher temperature uh, and then the other star is surface temperature. And then the other star is a red giant. It's got a lower temperature. Remember the low temperatures to the right, high temperatures are to the left. But it's got eight times the luminosity. Now the luminosity scale, if you go back and look at the HR diagrams, these are logarithmic. And so, you know, we could easily have, uh, you know, a luminosity here and something ten times larger here and something a hundred times larger. So. Uh, something shifted that much on an HR diagram. Uh, star B is going to be 10 or 20 or, you know, some number of um, times more luminous than star A. So that's what we're guessing. Now, we never got exact numbers for a lot of this, but we could. Now, I, I started to do that, but I thought, of, you know, the problem was getting too detailed in any case. But just, you know, to show what could happen here, we already know the temperatures, so we know where things are on this axis. We can start with the temperature, bring a line up until we hit kind of the middle 
of the main sequence. We're guessing star A is a main sequence star. And then from that location, we can, sh we can turn and go horizontally out to our luminosity scale, and that will give us a value for luminosity. Same thing with star B. We can start with its temperature, come up into the giant uh, stage here. Now, the giant region is a little more difficult. Um, probably, probably the main sequence star is more reliable. There's going to be some uncertainty in this, but we'll get an idea of luminosity. We'll get an idea of the uh, luminosity of, of star B is 11 times greater. And once we know the luminosities, we can work back through all these problems. So once we know the luminosities, and we can use the HR diagram uh, as a way to calibrate that, um, we can figure out how far away the star cluster is, and we can figure out specific numbers for the diameters. Of say. So we, we can work back and get all of those, not just as ratios, um, but as um, measured values for the individual stars. Okay, so if you get a star cluster, you know, and you can sample a hundred or a thousand different stars, uh, you can tighten uh, the values for those numbers that you've got. Uh, because on the HR diagram, if you're bringing up many, many of these and comparing their um, luminosities by using the, the brightness observed on Earth, um, we can end up getting a best fit for what are the, the values of, dis of distance for the entire star cluster, and then for the individual diameters. So, uh, you know, you get a clue here, a clue there, and you start piecing all of that together. All right, here's a problem on the cosmological redshift. So uh, this deals with the expansion of space, so we spent a fair amount of time working with this. Now remember, uh, our, our best measurement for the age of the universe is uh, 13,000... Uh, 13.8 uh, billion years, giga years, and so I'm going to write that in millions of years for this problem. So I wrote it as 13,800 million years. Now, um, what does that really mean? And uh, if we look at the expansion rate currently and uh, estimate how the expansion rate has varied in the past by looking at, at deep objects in space, um, we, we run back to a high temperature, high density uh, phase that the entire universe was in. Uh, remember, this is like the Big Bang Theory theme song, right? The whole universe was in a hot, dead state. Um, then 13 billion years ago, something, something, something. Uh, so 13.8 billion years or 13,800 million years. Now, we've simplified uh, this... Um, speeding up and slowing down of the expansion. Uh, we said that if we assume just a uniform expansion, we could derive some very useful equations, and we did that. And so I'm going to make use of those. Uh, we said that the redshift, uh, if it's been expanding uniformly, the redshift could be written uh, in terms of uh, the current time, uh, the 13 point, um, 13,800 uh, million years, uh, divided by the time at which the light left some distant galaxy. So here is galaxy B, and light is leaving, and it's returning to A, and the path looks a little curved because uh, space is expanding as the light is traveling from galaxy B to galaxy A. That's what it's going to look like on our graph. Now, these are the distances to, those, uh, to galaxy B at the time the light left uh, and when it arrived. And then when we talk about the distance to a galaxy, typically we really mean how much time has it taken for the light to get here. So in problem 25, what the book gives us is uh, a galaxy that's 7 million light years away and one that's 70. Now, the book giving us a value of 7 million light years, 7 million light years is like nothing. Okay, uh, The Andromeda galaxy is two million light years away, I want to say. That's one of the nearest galaxies, and that's just part of our local cluster. So if you're working too close, you're not going to see the overall effect of cosmological expansion. So I'm not even sure if seven million light years out is enough to be using this uniform expansion approximately. In any case, they gave us that problem. 
So I'm going to say that distance means that the light has been traveling uh, 7 million light years away. It means the light's been traveling for 7 million years. And if it's 70 million light years away, that means the light's been traveling for 70 million years. Now, that's not a very big number compared with 13,800. And uh, as we said in, in, in class, in lecture, um, we really set ourselves up with some formulas so that we could go much farther back in time. Uh, the formulas that we have, these small values, um, are useful when we're looking for just small shifts in the wavelength. But um, we want to allow ourselves to be able to look at much larger shifts. So anyway, we set everything up using what I was calling this um, redshift ratio of TH divided by T0. Now, T0 is equal to TH minus T, where T is the amount of time it's been traveling. Now, in most of these problems, we, we don't know what T0 was. Okay, I guess I could write a problem that starts with that. But if you look at the textbook, for example, uh, very commonly the way these problems get written up is that this is just considered to be known. Uh, the 13,800 is something we know uh, and that we can use in whatever problem. And then the distance out to the galaxy uh, can be used as how much time uh, has gone by since it left. And so that says that T0 is TH minus T. So I went ahead and used the formula we developed in class, and I got a redshift of 1.0005075, and that's not very much. It's not very impressive, right? Uh, we saw examples in class, and we'll see some in the practice. Uh, we've got one more day of review uh, for, the, for midterm four, and so we have another chance to come back and, and look at some large, much larger redshifts than this. Uh, these are some pretty close nearby galaxies. Um, and so what we did is, is um, the observed wavelength is equal to the redshift times the original wavelength. So the shift we would expect here for something starting off, we said the line that we're looking at is the 656 nanometer line in hydrogen. And the shift we got is the 0.33 uh, 656.333 nanometers. So the shift, which is what they asked for, is just that 0.333. Now you guys might be worried about significant figures, and I, I think you'd be justified to say, well, wait a minute. If it's only a shift of 0.333, we, we didn't know that this was, you know, this, this wavelength here, is, it's not 656.000. So uh, how are we getting away with this? And it's, it's one of those situations, I've, I've got another slide after this, we'll show how this works. But I can keep extra digits here, subtract this, take the difference, and, and it is reliable to however many significant figures everything else has here, uh, specifically how many sig figures we have right there. Excluding the ones and the zeros, how many sig figs do we have here? And we can keep that number here. We'll, we'll see how that works. Uh, so for the really close by galaxy, 7 million light years, I mean, that's like next door, uh, 0.333 nanometers, and then carrying out the same calculation, uh, 3.34 nanometers. And again, it's, it, makes, it makes you a little nervous, makes me a little nervous, uh, because I'm just not sure, can I really get away with uh, keeping that many sig figs in this ratio? So here's the other approach. Now, the book has been using, instead of big R, which we defined as just the, the flat-out ratio, of the wavelengths. The book's been using Z. Now, Z and R are related by some pretty simple formulas. To take an R value and turn it into a Z, we just subtract one. So if we looked at the problems that we had back here, uh, see if I just take the ones off, then it's pretty clear I've got those significant, uh, if I took the one off here, for example, then the 5075 are clearly the significant figures I would be working with. Okay. Uh, I changed it to 13,700. Oh, no. Uh, so, uh, the, the number, the best, the best measurement for years and years was 13,000, was 13.7 billion years. And then, I don't know, some number of years back, not too many years back, uh, it kind of drifted to 13.8. I, I somehow went into the past. Anyway, you can use either you can use the 13.7 or 13.8. I'm okay with either one. 
Uh, and so I went through and I solved what Z is keeping track of, and Z specifically is delta lambda over lambda naught. And so by using uh, this in, directly in terms of, of delta lambda, uh, that works really well when the uh, redshift is not such a big effect. When the delta lambdas are pretty small, uh, the mathematics works better. And then I went through some algebra and uh, wrote down what R is and, and how we could measure that in terms of TH and T. And then did some more algebra and showed what Z would be. So you can imagine, you know, on this problem, you're given a value of TH, you're given a value of T, because they tell you the distance, and you could work in terms of R, or you could work in terms of Z. Now there's other formulas we developed that, well, we developed everything exclusively in terms of big R, but you could go back and shift any of those around, or just convert back and forth as needed in a problem, uh, depending on, you know, whether it's a pretty recent, um, it, it's, a, it's a nearby galaxy and the light that's arriving has left pretty recently or if it's, if it's a, a good ways back in the history of the universe. Okay, so um, here's another example, another homework problem, 4427. And uh, this is a galaxy rate of separation. And I think that's the reason I included this. Um, you know, people in science, people in physics, we all have a difficult time um, with, with uh, the language that we're using, I feel like, uh, in science. So it really helps to be clear. Um, like in this problem, for example, it says, how fast is the galaxy moving? Well, the galaxy isn't moving at, at any particular speed. Remember, uh, space is expanding, and the galaxies are kind of adrift in space. And since space is expanding, uh, the galaxies are just being carried away from each other. Uh, so it's a rate of separation. Uh, it's, maybe it's dangerous using the symbol V, uh, but V here stands for a rate of separation of two locations in space. Okay, so it's not that the galaxies are racing through space. Uh, the galaxies are sitting at some location in space. Space expands. Galaxies are just along for the ride. Um, so, uh, in this problem, they, they just told us Z was 0 0.060, and using the formulas that we looked at on the previous page, that means I can predict uh, uh, delta lambda over lambda not using Z. But for this problem, I switched over into our formula, because in the book they're using a, a Doppler uh, velocity formula that just doesn't apply in general relativity. Okay, it's an approximation formula, and it does give the same answer, but kind of for the wrong reasons. So the formula we've developed actually starts from the assumption that space is expanding, and that is the effect that's taking place here. So uh, I converted the Z into R, and then used the formula we had derived, and found that uh, the galaxies are separating, us and this galaxy, are separating at you know, about 6% of the speed of light. Okay, so something to think, think, uh, think of, uh, think through, I guess. And then I think this is it. This is the last homework problem, so I, I think we're there. And I think we've looked again at a good collection of homework problems. Uh, this uh, last example from the homework is looking at nucleosynthesis, uh, the generation of different isotopes of different elements through nuclear fusion processes inside the cores of stars. And, uh, you know, where did all the magnesium come from? Uh, there's a fair amount of magnesium uh, in, in the universe, in, in our planet. Uh, we've got a whole collection of elements. And all of those were generated through nuclear synthesis processes somewhere, either inside the cores of stars or during, during a core collapse of um, a supernova explosion. So uh, these kinds of very energetic reactions are where these heavier elements are being generated. So in this problem, I think they ask in the first part, what's Q, how much energy is being released, if inside a high mass star, carbon-12 is fusing into magnesium-24? Now, that's probably going to be a high-energy photon that's coming out. So, uh, the, in, in this example, uh, notice 
Uh, one of the particles coming out is the magnesium-24. The other one is this high-energy photon. And look how much energy they carry away from the reaction. Between the two of them, they have to carry away 13.93 MeV of kinetic energy. So kind of split between the magnesium-24 nucleus that has just formed. The electrons are... It, it's all plasma at this point. At these high temperatures, the electrons are just spectators. They're not attached to any atoms. So uh, we've got a carbon-12 nucleus, carbon-12 nucleus. Uh, they react, form a magnesium-24 nucleus, and a high-energy photon gets generated. I can calculate the Q for that by taking the mass on this side, two uh, carbons, and subtract off the mass of the magnesium and, and the uh, photon. Now, the photon's mass is zero, so I, I didn't include it, but it's there in the reaction. And so, again, the, the total amount of energy released, 13.93, and that's going to show up either, uh, you know, some of it's going to be in the magnesium-24, some of it's going to be in that high-energy photon. All right, uh, it asked also about potential energy barrier. How large would the potential energy barrier be? Um, for two carbon-12 nuclei, and again, we're going to use that um, kind of idealized uh, approximation where we assume that the two nuclei come directly towards each other uh, along one axis, a head-on collision, with equal momentum for both. So each one is bringing in the same amount of kinetic energy into the reaction. So let's see uh, the formula we have been we've developed that we've been looking at Z1 Z Z2 K E squared over R. It's two carbon nuclei, so that's six protons each, and then there's twelve nucleons total. So uh, the radius of each of these comes out at two point seven five. That means a center to center distance between the two carbon nuclei between their centers uh, will be. 5.50 femtometers. So I put in our shortcut value for Ke squared for the electric force constant, uh, put in the factors of 6, put in the R, and ended up with uh, a potential energy barrier due to electric repulsion between the nuclei, the positively charged nuclei, uh, 9.43 MeV. Now what that would suggest is, you know, kind of under ideal conditions, a head-on collision where each of the uh, nuclei brings in half of that energy. So each nucleus would need to come in with a kinetic energy of 4.71 MeV. That's, that's how we're, we're thinking of all this. And so um, each nucleus is bringing in that much. And then they say, okay, what temperature would we be at if this were a typical amount of kinetic energy? And so we can go back to thermodynamics and say that uh, the kinetic energy, uh, the average, I should have put an average sign, average kinetic energy uh, is equal to 3 halves little k, which is Boltzmann's constant, times the temperature, and then we could flip that formula around. So the temperature at which the average, just the average kinetic energy, would be 4.71 uh, works out to be 3.64 10 to the tenth Kelvin. So we're looking at, you know, 36 billion Kelvin inside the core of a, a star that would be able to generate uh, samples of magnesium-24. That's just, you know, it's an estimate number. Now, it doesn't have to be that all the carbon-12s have that kinetic energy. It could be, on average, uh, it could be the average kinetic energy is much lower. But at this temperature, uh, this reaction could be proceeding at a pretty good clip. Okay, it could be happening at a pretty good rate. Now, there's, there's too many Ks in, this, in these last couple uh, formulas here. Let's go back. This is Boltzmann's constant, so you can write a big Boltzmann here. This is the Boltzmann constant we're familiar with, 1.38, 10 to the minus 23 uh, joules per Kelvin. I switched it into EV and then into MEV, and so uh, I had to switch that over into EV per Kelvin and then MEV, 
check it, try it out. Try the calculation, see if you get the same number, see if you're off by a factor of a million. That's easy to have happen on these uh, problems. So each nucleus would need to come in with that much kinetic energy and at a temperature of 36 billion Kelvin, um, you know, the, the carbon-12 nuclei would have that much kinetic energy. Uh, so this nuclear uh, nucleosynthesis reaction could be happening. All right, so uh, we've got midterm four coming up in the not-too-distant future. I hope these, these uh, homework problems, going through them is, is useful to kind of think about what's going on uh, conceptually so that setting up the problems will make sense so that you can talk your way uh, through setting up the problems. As always, um, if you guys have any questions, uh, stop by office hours. All right, that's it for the day.